Hey, everyone. I'm here today live with Chris Niebauer. Hi, Chris. Hi. And um, just following up and finishing up on our um, second podcast conversation, the episode dropped this morning. I believe uh, we settled on the title, Mind Your Thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I didn't come up with that. That was my PA, but I like it. It was a good one. And and we just continued our conversation about the mind and the brain and intuition. And um, I'm excited to keep chatting today. I'm going to make sure we're live on my little phone here so I can monitor that. Um, there we are. Okay. I'm going to open that. Did I I know a couple people on my end were coming too? I don't see them yet, but they'll be here. Um, okay. We're good to go. Okay. So I wanted to start Chris with something that you said in the episode that has been reverberating in my brain since, since that time you talked about a study where they left people alone within a room with the ability to shock themselves. And a certain number of people, and you said that was mostly male and stop me anywhere if I'm remembering wrong, um, chose after a period of time being left alone with their own thoughts to shock themselves rather than sit there alone in silence. And I think that's a really interesting place to start because um, it really resonated with me, which which is maybe not a good thing to say. (laughs) Um, And I just have a lot of thoughts about it. So Share it again from your perspective, and then I'm going to tell you what's coming through for me. Sure. I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but the, I think it was 50% of the males actually shocked themselves at some point, and the number was a little lower for females. But the most surprising thing about the study is that anyone would do it at all. I mean, you might expect one out of a thousand, but um, you know, to have numbers, anything above 20% would, was pretty shocking because it goes so counterintuitive to what we're, you would think, well, we always want to run from pain and, and, uh, and, and go towards pleasure. And yet you have people in a situation where nothing is wrong. They have, they don't, there's not a problem in the world. Physically, everything is fine. It's just you have to sit alone with your thoughts. And you'd think, well, that's really not so bad, right? And yet, uh, apparently, our thoughts are so disturbing to some of us. And, and, and it is interesting. The good news, it wasn't 100%. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> okay, so that's good. Only half of the people shock themselves. Yeah, so, um, but so it's true. It, you know, for, I, and I, f- I found that in the literature, when you look at uh, self-talk, uh, they did some interesting studies where they would follow people around where they would text them randomly and they would say, what was just going on in your head? And there's a small percentage of people who nothing is going on. And so they literally have, uh, their norm is just inner silence. And so it's important that, you know, there are some people out there who really do live in these peaceful places where uh, the thinking mind comes online only when it has to. But for a lot of us, that's not the case. And, uh, and of course, my work, um, it's so centered around that other half that has to live with this uh, strange situation where we'd rather shock ourselves to get us out of our thinking mind. Right. And so, you know, um, you know, what else are we doing in our lives to get us out of our thinking mind? And if we're going to shock ourselves, what else are we going to do? <laughs> well, I think that we often do do that, right? I think oftentimes you're not used to the quiet or, you know, we're looking, here's how it comes through for me. And, and my, the, my science mind has a lot of questions about that study. So I'm not, I'm not done with it yet, but my intuitive mind says, look, a lot of times we are used to a certain amount of discontent and that internal discontent is driving us to seek out more external discontent because that energy wants to move. It wants to flow. It wants to release. And therefore we create this cycle of, I want to move this discontented energy, right? By finding it in the outside world. And then of course, you know, we shock ourselves and then we increase rather than decrease the sense of discontent. I don't know if that made sense. Yeah, I mean, it's it's we 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 have this thinking mind, and I and I talk a lot about this in in a little bit about this in in the new book, the workbook for no self, no problem, and then I'm going into this much more explicitly. I'm actually actively working on this other book right now. We don't even have a title for it. I'm not sure, but uh, a lot of it takes us back to when the thinking mind first evolved, 
And it's just interesting to consider our species 100,000 years ago. Right. I just did a video on this. And, you know, if we made it through the night, the first problem, the first real problem we had was breaking our fast. So we'd have to get breakfast. We'd have to actually, you know, go out and get some food, find some water. That's a real problem. And I think that's what the thinking mind evolved for. It, it evolved to solve these actual problems in the world, getting food, not being someone else's food, <laughs> finding right. shelter, very basic things. Now, for so many of us, we have all these comforts. We ha- we're, we're, All this has been satisfied. And, and the thinking mind just has nothing to do. So it creates problem after problem. And the way you put it is, when, when you have an internal state that is, it, it ne- needs a problem, it desperately wants, it's going to project out into the world and it's going to find something. So that energy is going to go out into the world and it's going to create problems because that's, that, that's its end state. That's its goal. Right. That's what it knows how to do. Yeah. And, and because we have this wonderful thing called the law of attraction and because what our internal state reflects our external state. And Chris and I were talking, I, I don't know if you believe in the law of attraction, but um, it's oh. a big <laughs> yeah. Oh, you do. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a big thing that we talk about on the podcast, and it's it's a big part thing that I teach about. But because we have this, because our internal state is always attracting more to us, right? We just keep feeding the beast. We just keep feeding the beast, and then we don't even know we're doing it. Um, you know, a lot of times the way that you shock yourself, you don't even know you're shocking yourself, right? You don't know that you're being provocative or you don't know that you're looking for trouble. You're just doing what you know how to do. You're doing it probably unconsciously. And the next thing you know, you're like, why am I getting shocked? (laughs) Well, for so many of us, it feels, and I remember back in my twenties when I was a total neurotic mess, it would feel so good to have a break from the thinking mind. It felt so good that actually I can really relate to the, those people in the study because if I had that choice right now to go back and live with the thoughts that I had in my twenties or shock my, I would rather shock myself. Wow! <laughs> and so I, I you know, I, I definitely can relate to that. And um, I was focusing a little bit. Uh, I was doing a little writing this morning and I was thinking, well, okay, what do, how do we work with this thinking mind? Because it's clearly in need of something. And uh, and I, I think my wife and my daughter, every morning they do that um, puzzle, that uh, some word puzzle online, I forget what, it's real popular. And I think, why do we do this, you know? Because it's interesting, some people do crossword puzzles. And this morning I was actually looking up some of the research and there's all kinds of benefits of doing crossword puzzles and, and doing these little things in the morning. And then it hit me that maybe that's what we kind of need to do, you know, give the thinking mind a real, a problem for it. So you get up in the morning, you do your crossword puzzle, and now the thinking mind is like, okay, it got it. it that's what it does is it solves these problems. And now it's going to turn down a little bit for the rest of the day. And if you don't do that, and I thought, you know, it can come back in so many, it's just going to keep, it's like a program running. It's going to keep working. It's going to manipulate the external world. So it, it creates these problems. And I thought, why not just give it a problem to solve in the morning? And so I thought, well, maybe, you know, I never thought much of crossword puzzles, but I might start doing these. <laughs> Because well, give the mind, you know, keep it busy, give it a task. And with an end state. The nice thing ah. about a crossword puzzle is you, when you're done, you're done. Right. And so that's the thing, like computer games, you know, if I can go back to grad school and I used to play computer games, but, and they're still really popular, but the, the thing about time I mean, in grad school to play computer games. <laughs> uh, probably too much. Yeah. The model where I went to school is that students worked 110% of the time. And I think we are probably around 150. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I, I'm jealous, man. I, I barely even had time to keep up with LA law dating uh, myself. Yeah. I had a lot of time in grad school. I was just asked, I was talking with someone they were, and they were interested in my, why I'm so into Jung. And I spent way too much time in grad school. I was supposed to be doing neuroscience and I was, reading Jung and and uh, quantum mechanics and all this stuff for fun. And so I actually had a lot of time. In That's gra- amazing. That's how you got to be doing what you're doing now. I was just doing psychology. <laughs> um. Anyway, you were saying, I didn't mean to interrupt. So we're talking about video games and... Oh. The video game, this doesn't have an end state to it. You finish level one, it goes to level two, it goes to, and you, that's why you can end up spending like 10 hours playing video games. I like when I suggest people do give the mind some problem to solve, make it with a, a solution. And that's the nice thing about a crossword puzzle or the um, I'm drawing a blank on this, it's like word something, it's it's this little Wordle. Wordle. I, I haven't <laughs> played it, I've just seen it posted yeah, on but, Facebook, but it's a very specific problem, and the mind might enjoy that. And, and and it gives the mind some food 
because again, it doesn't. Ha- and and if we could go back to the state of our ancestors, we probably wouldn't have any problems. I mean, we would have real problems. Right. <laughs> that that's the thing the mind evolved for. But we wouldn't be making up problems. And right. uh, and I think our ancestors may have actually had a way. Like once that mind solved the problem, then they came back into the present moment. So they may have actually spent more time in the present moment than any of us do. Sure. Because, because, you know, yeah, they had real dangers, but each one of those was a specific task. It got solved. And then he went back to being in the, in, in the here and now. And so maybe by satisfying all of our needs and uh, this plethora of luxury that we surround ourselves with, with microwaves and, um, uh, uh, you know, ovens and all these refrigerators and processed food, we've, we've created our own problem because now the, the problem solving thinking mind has no more problems to solve. And so it just invents these things. And now it may have escalated to the point that it's very hard for us. I mean, when you think about all these mindfulness and meditative practices, what is their purpose? And then the thing that stands out, at least for me, is that their purpose is to bring us into that, that state of presence being in the here and now and recognizing that right here and right now, everything is absolutely okay. So the, just like those people in that experiment, they were just sitting in a room. Physically, they were fine. They had no problems outside of the problems that they were creating. And so I was suggesting to people to add this to their meditative and mindfulness practices, you know, throw in a crossword puzzle and, and we might have to adjust it for some of us, maybe a couple. In the no self, no problem workbook. I actually call this distraction therapy. Okay, <laughs> which uh, I think works too, and um, that's why you know I love playing guitar so much because when I'm playing guitar, and I think that's the wonderful thing about music, and I think that our ancestors they sang, they danced, they played drums, they you know they there was they did so much that turned the thinking mind off, or at least was a distraction from the thinking mind. And I would even say this, and I, I'm curious to know what you think, but I would say too, because the way that I understand it is the mind is a tool. It's a tool. And it's a tool that's sort of, you know, taken over. <laughs> it's it's a tool that we've now become the tool of if we're not careful. Um, but it's a tool. It can be used. I like to, when I am able... <laughs> <laughs> to use my tool, my, my mind as a tool for my higher self, for my higher wisdom, for, you know, for my higher divinity and to be human and to express itself through human form, just like I have a body, right? I also have a brain, which, you know, and a mind uh, that doesn't give me consciousness or awareness, it's my understanding, but it is a tool that I can use to communicate, to talk, to solve human-like problems, except I want to talk about that too, because I don't think thinking solves a lot of problems. But, um, um, but I lost my train of thought, but it's a tool. So I would say when you're playing guitar, right, you're using your mind as a tool, but when you're in the flow, when you are playing music, you're not just distracting yourself, you're tuning into something greater. You're letting that flow through you. And then the mind takes its rightful place of where do I put my fingers? Where do I put my hands? Where do I go next? Right. It becomes subservient to that higher self. And to me, that's the ticket. It's not losing the mind altogether, though. I think I have a podcast episode called a losing your mind, (laughs) but um, in a good way, but it's about not getting lost in it. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. And that's why I, you know, when you're playing guitar, you really are, or any kind of music, you know, we really are getting in touch with something far beyond our ego or thinking mind. And, and that really is our true self. Yeah. And you can't put it into words, you know, you can't, there's no mathematical equation that's going to find finally describe it. Uh, but you can experience it. And and that's the interesting paradox is that so many of us, uh, that's the real trick of the thinking mind, is for so many of us, it we fall into this thinking that it's us, that the thinking mind is our true uh, identity. And it should just come out, solve problems, and and those are those moments, whether you're writing. Uh, the thinking mind gets turned down just enough. And all of a sudden that, that kind of whirlwind of like the, the true right. self just comes on. <laughs> and it's been there the whole time. It's right. just, it just manifests in a way that's more obvious. 
And um, and that's one of the wonderful things I like about writing is, uh, you know, I don't write any of this stuff in the sense that my ego writes any of it. And while I can tell, maybe 10% is e- of a little bit of its ego, you could see that. And that's not the very good stuff. And you can tell that that's, right, you know, right. but but the, the really good stuff comes from a mysterious place that no one knows. Right. Just, no one has any clue where this stuff comes from. And uh, that's <laughs> that's really should be very weird to all like, okay. It's well, very wonderful in my mind. Those are the moments of goal. When I do a session with somebody or I do a podcast, and again, it isn't all inspired. I'm a human being and 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 the mind comes in sometimes and, and tries to, you know, grab grab for its space. But a lot of it, and especially in my sessions, I'm getting out of the way and I'm letting something bigger work through me. And it's a good thing that I have a mind because sometimes and that I have, I have, you know, we talked too about education. I got a lot of that, a lot, a lot, a lot of that. And one of my favorite things is when my guidance, you know, um, pokes on this thing that I know. Um, and it'll, you know, I'll be like, oh, you know, I know this study or, oh yeah, I know this thing about this problem you're having right now. I, oh, I know this technique that often helps. Um, but a lot of times I think a lot of people, when you lead with the brain, you're going through the Rolodex going, what do I know? What do I know? What do I know? How do I solve that problem from what do I know? It's cumbersome. It's stressful. And it's sort of like, you know, throwing darts at a wall with a blindfold and, you know, every once in a while you're going to hit the target, but a lot of times you're just going to, you know, throw darts against the wall. And I think when we use our intuition more, that's what I think really solves the problems. For me, if I was, and this is what I wanted to get at before, I really believe if you ever watch an animal, right, hunting or stalking or like, you know, I think, and even for me, I've had past life memories of being a hunter and um, it was all intuitive. It was all intuitive. It was tuning into the flow of life. It was feeling into the interconnectedness. It was using my hunches. That was how you found your next meal. So again, I'm not 100% sure I even believe the mind was created for that. And again, I know that goes against a lot of the science and a lot of our beliefs, but I I personally don't think it's that simple for my own experience. And I think even so, there was probably much more of a dovetailing between this mind structure, the brain, and um, just like the rest of our body and intuition when we first started out. And I think now there's just such a huge split. Yeah, it's funny you'd mentioned that. I was just having a conversation about intuition, and they pointed out um, some of the classic research in, in psychology uh, during the 50s and, well, during the 70s, I think it was. And uh, so much of it showed that what we lo- what was suspected to be tuition was just off the mark over and over again. Okay. And, and so, you know, all the heuristics, uh, the re- like the representative this heuristic, I've given this thousands of times in class where you say something like, you know, like Joe is short, slim, and likes to read poetry. Is Joe more likely an Ivy League English professor or a truck driver? And, and, and our heuristics want to go, you know, judge a book by its cover and stereotypes. And, and most people will say Ivy League English professor, but there's very few Ivy League schools, very fewer uh, English departments and, and fewer that are short and slim. So the number becomes ridiculously small. So the actual answer is a truck driver. Right. But the problem is, I don't think of that as intuition. To me, that's a reflection of the thinking mind. That's the thinking mind in survival mode. And it's it, and, and to me, this, this in, the real intuition comes from a greater intelligence that's not concerned with survival. It's, it's more about uh, creativity. It's more about... Um, that the experience of being alive and just showing like being that unique creation in the universe rather than trying to survive. Um, and so I see them as really different. And yes. actually so much of the book, the the workbook that, and I think the workbook actually should be available for pre-sale like today. I think. Today oh my God, is, that's amazing. Seriously. I, we could... It might be pre-order, so it might not be up yet, but I think. No, no, no. I'm so excited. Oh, I'm so honored that you're on my live out and <laughs> That's so cool. Yay. I, I haven't checked it, but uh, I'm going to check it. Yeah, that's I'll what the, check it. I'm getting it. No, cool. Okay, go ahead. Well, that's, but so much of it is, a, it was about this. I, I, I've taught cognitive psychology for such a long time. And I've done all these things with visual illusions, with heuristic mistakes, and all the cognitive therapy stuff where catastrophizing with all the cognitive errors that we go through. And again, my take is that all that reflects the thinking mind. And but then that's just a small, tiny part of what it means to be human. We've right. got this vast 
uh, right. range of experiences that go way beyond this. And so all the, so the book is filled with this practice that's a practice to all the stuff I used to teach in class, but just showing you how inflexible, like I can give you a problem. And like, if I say, what's the next number? And I say two, four, six, like eight just probably popped into your head. Right. <laughs> and so w- that's the kind of program like nature of the, of the thinking right. mind. And to me, that's not intuition. That's, that that's heuristic flaws that are prone to the yes. mind works. Yes, yes. And more. Yes. And I think in one of my gripes, and I actually just, I didn't record it, but I did a little, sometimes I just <laughs> give podcasts to myself, um, you know, in anticipation of maybe recording them. But I was talking about that. The, mis- the One of the reasons I'm not always a fan of the word intuition, even though it's kind of my brand, is um, because as a psychologist, it's not under, a lot of people understand intuition, not the way I do is connection to my divinity. Um, but as all those unconscious biases, which mm-hmm. is to me, the mind, it's the unconscious portion of the mind, which is most of the mind, because it's also my understanding that a lot of time when we think we're making a decision, decisions been made, we're taking ownership of it. When we see that it's there, we're saying, Oh, that's mine. But it's most of the work of your thinking mind is unconscious. And a lot of times you don't even know why you do things. You, you make up a reason why you do things because we like to believe that, you know, we're in control um, of the mind, but the mind, that's just more mind kind of messing you up. But there's a lot of good research, right? That says a lot of this stuff happens unconsciously. Oh, I, I think Benjamin Labette in the seventies was a neuroscientist who had access to the brain and took three oh. simple measurements, you know, something as simple as just, okay, move a finger and then the brain uh, activation. And then the psychological sensation of when I chose to make that decision and the choice came way after the brain yeah. event. So, so, so yeah. much of what we feel as the CEO upstairs here, making these decisions, um, it, it's just an afterthought, uh, and that's yeah. that's really the essence of the no self philosophy. Right, and there is no pilot in the captain's chair making these decisions, and um, it's a very interesting when you, when you get that experience going. Um, it can be a really interesting one because it, that hallucinate that ho- illusion of the self being in control. That's the kind of the status quo for most of us, yeah. and it really feel. And, but when you do enough practice with the no self philosophy, you realize that uh, you know there is a flow to all of this, and and there's no captain uh, controlling. It, it's like it's self. It's all. It's 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 difficult for the thinking mind to to understand this because we're so used to being like a captain in control. Like there always has to be a bridge on a, on a ship and there has to be a command center. And, and then when we look at like a flock of birds and one of the things that was so mysterious for the scientists when they were studying this is no one bird was controlling the, the movement of the flock of birds. I mean, it was all like so right. all interconnected and they were all, it wasn't like there was a, uh, you know, a president that was, or CEO who was in charge of it. And when you start, at least for me, when, when you start experiencing nature and people say, you know, if you get the thinking mind to turn down a little bit, all of a sudden nature becomes very alive, yeah. I mean, really alive. I was just out at Sedona, uh, maybe a month or so ago. And you say, well, a rock, these rocks, I mean, nothing could be more dead than a rock. But that's just not the way it feels when you're out there. There's there's an energy. There's there there's a presence, and then all of nature that just has this aliveness to it. And uh, then you it's like a 180 flip, degree flip. Like thoughts, which seem so alive, become dead and lifeless, like a computer program. And then all of nature takes on this living presence, which is. Um, you know, that's the mystery of the shaman, I think, that, that they were experiencing. To them, nature was, it was all alive, but there's no, there's no captain. <laughs> no, it's the flow. And you participate in the flow of life. And you participate in your, with your awareness. And you feel yourself, it's like if you see a river, right? You can paddle upstream like a crazy person. Or you can feel into the flow, you can ride the boat, you can feel which way the current, and you can kind of guide the boat, you can feel with it, you can feel into it. And I think the majority of human beings are swimming upriver. They're swimming upriver, they're trying to make, you know, um, they're going against the flow of life. Animals, I think they, they can't not go with the flow of life, and they do feel into the interconnectedness, and they do 
um, you know, have all of their natural intuitive abilities that say we're flowing, we're flying this way. Yeah. There's no captain. There's no need for a captain. We just know what to do and we know how to do it together because we're tuned into that channel. We're tuned into, you know, our purpose, our mission, um, which sounds weird if you're a bird, but I think it's the same thing when people come to me and they're like, what is my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? It's you got to relax into it. You got to feel into it. It's greater than you. It's bigger than you. And I don't think the mind solves very many problems. I think for the most part, the, the, the human mind has become a problem creator and, um, it, it could be a great tool. I love having one. I spent a lot of time developing it. I don't use it so much anymore, but, but I know it's there. Um, but, uh, but that's what I think. That's what I think. And you could see the, in human history, those times when our ego had um, got a little damaged, you know, when we figured out like the earth is not the center of the universe. And then, right. you know, we figured out evolution and we, that we're just another species on the planet. And, we, and, and this is, I think another stage of this will be when we understand that not understand, but when we feel that greater intelligence and we'll realize that the thinking mind isn't nearly as smart as we thought it was. And all of a sudden, the world of the dolphin, the world of the elephant, all, they're going to look like geniuses to us. I love uh, that. Yes, because they are. And they are. Well, so we'll just recognize the true intelligence uh, right. of nature and that we're not nearly as smart as we thought we were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, but we do have an interesting mission and purpose to, to contend with this, this monster that has been created. <laughs> um, but like I said, I love having one. I just, I really just believe it's, it's in how you use it. Now, my brain or my guidance or something uh, has a couple more questions about evolution and evolution of the mind and brain, because I know the story is. And, and this is taught everywhere, and I'm sure it's somewhat true. I just don't personally believe it for some reason all of a sudden. Um, that, you know, the brain that we have was developed for this, you know, kind of survival situation when we were primitive and that now we're just always thinking that we survive. I mean, you said that. I am not 100% sure I agree with that. Um, and I want to get this from the guides, and then I want to just get what you think. And, and I, I'm not trying to... Uh, question or challenge you because I know what you're teaching is the thing, but my um, my guidance wants to tweak it. Is that okay? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I want to see what they're trying to say. Well, what they're trying to say, okay, the question they wanted me to ask you, this is a weird question. Evolutionarily, has lateralization of the brain gotten more so over the course of development of humans and um, animals? From a scientific neuroscience perspective, that question is absolutely yes. Okay. When you, when you look at the division of labor, when you when you look at um, nature's way of creating two different processing centers, but then connecting them through this corpus callosum, uh, the connection the, between the two sides of the brain, uh, that's you see a very clear progression. Progression, you know, if we want to use that phrase, but um, with humans being pretty much maximally lateralized because we have that thing with language and it, it's so dominant on the left side, right. but you see precursors to this and like other great apes and um, other species, you'll see like precursors to Broca's area, that part that is allowing me right. to talk right now. And, but so again, the, the basic idea with evolution is this, yeah, you know, but then you have to rem remember who's theorizing about evolution. It's us. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And I want to stop to give people the background on that question, because they may not all be neuroscience geeks like yours truly. And also they might not have all have read your amazing book, No Self, No Problem, which is there in the background, but we haven't mentioned it once. And that is how I found Chris. I read his book a couple summers ago and just blew my mind and made me so happy because it it tied together for me a lot of a lot of things where I started, which was as a cognitive psychologist with a love of neuropsychology to uh, what I do now, a weird lady who talks, I'm not weird at all. I am weird, but I, I own it. But anyway, a lady who talks to spirit guides. Um, so it's, it's been a journey. Um, but for me, your book is part of the bridging of that gap. But anyway, um, we have these two sides of our brain, right? And, and I'm going to butcher this. I should just let you say it. But um, and the left side is more what Chris 
talks about in the book, if I'm understanding him correctly, is the part of our brain that handles logic and reasoning and linear thinking. And it's the part that's trying to give us this false sense of self, but you can't actually find your sense of self in the brain because it doesn't exist. It's just your brain trying to, um, your, your mind trying to create that false structure. The right side of the brain, my understanding is more of our creativity, more of our intuition. It's not where language is. And I think what the guys were getting at is that it's partially this lateralization, these breaking off of these two things that is um, almost indicative of the separation of the human ego, the human false sense of self and the flow of life and our intuition and our deeper connection. And that as humans used to learn to use their brains in a more integrated fashion, that will be the next stage in our evolution. So that's what I'm getting. I have no idea what that means, but um, you're a neuroscientist. Tell me, does that make any sense whatsoever? Oh, absolutely. Not just as a neuroscientist, but I think in, 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 in the language of spirituality, it makes a lot of sense to me. You know, there's nothing better than coming home after you've gotten lost. And so we can look at this whole evolutionary trip. As, I mean, the whole process of evolution is coming from nature. It's coming from the grand intelligence. And even the thinking mind is a product of this you know, grand intelligence. So it's, 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 it's not, you know, what I, I, it can be frustrating to people. And sometimes they get like, you know, oh, I, I just can't, I'm, you know, I can't stand myself. I can't stand my thoughts anymore. And yet at the same time, this thinking mind is the amazing miracle of this greater intelligence, but it's a wonderful trip to get lost and forget that and feel like you're, you know, I, alone, you know, in a world that you never made and, and and then to come home again. And so I think we're, that that's our spiritual mission. You know, we got lost on purpose. Um, in the, in the workbook, I even mentioned this as like kind of a metaphor for life that we're, we, you know, we go to these escape rooms and, and they're kind of cool little things where, you know, puzzle after puzzle and you, and you could find your way out, except we'll, when we find our way out, we'll realize that we were already there <laughs> to begin with this whole thing of feeling lost and, feeling alienated from nature and, and having the two sides of the brain being quite separate. So we have this, you know, left side that thinks all the time and that, and, and, and wants to control nature, manipulate it and change it in ways that uh, benefit itself. Right. And that whole trip, uh, one way to look at that whole trip is that it's, it's this part of a bigger um, exciting story that, that the universe is telling itself. Yeah. And when we come home, it'll be, you know, that it, it, it'll be a really, you know, amazing feeling, but you don't get that unless you were lost for a while. I love that. I love that. I think that is so beautiful. Um, Chris, as, as we start to think about wrapping up, cause I could talk to you for days, um, <laughs> <laughs> for reals. Um, what was I going to ask next? Are there any tools from the workbook? I think I've asked you this question a bunch of times, so I don't know. <laughs> Are there any tools from the workbook, like one tool that you would want to share with people to kind of whet their appetite? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of ways you could uh, work that. I think one practice is, so the thinking mind has a mission. Again, it's to solve problems. And, and there's always a, a certitude it has to kind of fake with this. Like, you know, trust me that, you know, this, you know, when you think about like a doctor coming in, I mean, the doctor has to come in and be very assertive and say, look, this is what you got. And the doctor may not know, you know, <laughs> for sure. They're just giving you this false sense of certitude. Right, but that's right. the thinking mind. So anytime you feel this, like, you know, I know for certain, you know, the thinking mind is behind all that. So one practice that I think is really, really important, and just to, to it's one of these practices you can actually walk through any day with from, be, from morning to night. And that is just that I don't know mind. And when you get into that, I don't know for certain, right. that is much more the right brain. That's much more in connection with this flow because the flow is, well, we can talk about it. And, and you know, we can, on a feeling level, we can kind of get that you're feeling the same way I'm feeling about it. But it's impossible to articulate precisely what we mean by it because it's truly a mystery. And that's who we are. We are ultimately an absolute mystery. So when you go on this quest and you're like, I need to know myself or just do something simple in a day where you turn on the news and you're like, oh, I know that story must be right. Um, 
just fall back into this practice of, I don't know. I don't know for sure. And even when it comes down to who I am. So th- th- yeah. there's another practice where it's like, I am. And then we were so used to filling that in with, I'm Chris. I'm a right. PhD. I'm, and then the list list goes on ad nauseum. It's <laughs> just, I am. Yeah, it's just, I am. And I love to just leave it at that. Just, I am. And then don't, and, and, and then let the mystery unfold. And, and the thinking mind looks at a mystery as like something that needs to be solved, but a mystery is something that is experienced. It's just an, it's just an experience. And it's a really wonderful thing when you, when you get that mode going and you feel it, you know, it, it, embrace the, I don't know. And you will feel the aliveness of nature. You will feel that it is all alive. And that's not a metaphor. I think, uh, Terrence would get, uh, he, he might have said that, but um, it was a wonderful quote. You know, it, it's, it's not a metaphor to say that nature is alive. No, nature is alive. Um, you can feel it. You can feel it, and it's and and it's it's the thinking mind that has created this image of materialism as dead matter, and that's just the thinking mind's projection. And right. so um, it's a it's a good practice. I don't know. I don't know, and realize that's a wonderful thing. That's not a limitation. Right. I also get, this is totally off the topic again, but I also get sometimes this information that if you look at the mind or the, the human awareness is sort of a, a tool, sort of a way of doing things. And at some point you plant like the wrong seed in there. I feel like that happened at some point in our evolution too. Something, something sent us awry. And then that seed has been sprouting and sprouting and sprouting and contaminating things. And now it's time for us to you know, look at that bizarre looking field to bring it back to awareness and, you know, recultivate it. Um, what do I mean by that? Because I don't know if you (laughs) understood what I, what I meant or what came through, but again, I think, um, sorry, I lost my, I didn't lose my train of thought. I'm just trying to figure out how to explain what I said. Did that resonate with you at all? Absolutely. It was I just, feel like it dropped out of left field, but it just no, it came fits from the Okay. You know, cool. Same thing, you know, we were talking about a little bit ago where, you know, yeah, we're off track. And, and but we we did it as a way to sort of fool ourselves. Yeah. And so, and so you know, we'll get back on track. And I, you know, I I really do have great faith in, in our species. I think I think I think we 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 got quite lost and we, and we may be quite lost right now in so many ways. But I do think the greater intelligence is um, uh, behind all of this, and, and 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 it's a fun thing to get lost. Like I said, and it's a fun thing to find your way home, and it's and, and we've left so many breadcrumbs for ourselves, little hints here and there, and um, and it's a wonderful little uh, task and that, that gives meaning in our lives to say, okay, you know, uh, I'm a, where where am I at right now, and maybe it's not. You know exactly where I want to be, but look, there's all these teachers out there. There's so many hints. The universe is, you know, at this point, you know, hitting you over the head, telling you like, look, you know, uh, wake up to the present moment, and everything's okay. And I think, you know, as Einstein, he said, you know, is the universe a friendly universe? And um, you know, I think that's an important question. You know, ask yourself, like, do you trust the universe? Wow, that's you know? huge. Yeah. And I don't know, again, this is my intuition, not my brain. It feels to me, does the right brain trust the universe more than the left brain? I, I would say absolutely. I think it's, it, I think the right brain has that, well, I have a t-shirt, I get comments on it. Every time I go out with it, it says something like leap and the bridge will appear. I because love it. It just connects with people see it and they're, they just, they just connect with it. And they're just like, um, and that to me epitomizes what the right brain does. It's right. all about faith. And and the left brain is the skeptic, and it's saying, "Don't trust the universe. Don't trust this. I'm out." Because it and it, the irony is because the left brain is the one that's out for itself, <laughs> right? It protects, and it sees the universe as a very unfriendly place. And um, all the things about the right brain, then uh, all the different types of processing, it all comes down to that idea of faith. And, and the reason it has faith is because it's connected. It's part of the right. flow, so it's easy right. for it to have faith. Right. If you're not connected and you don't know it's there and there's nothing to connect to, right, then of course the universe seems like a scary random place that you have to control. 
When you can feel into the flow and you start following that, you realize, oh no, everything makes perfect sense. And and the more I feel into the sense of that, the more things flow for me and the more I can align with the flow. Yeah. And that's like you were talking about the law of attraction. And to me, that really is the law of attraction is that when you start connecting with the flow, everything in your environment switches the the environment becomes more friendly so that's the, the you know the the universe is a friendly place if you jump uh, you know the bridge will appear but yeah. if you get locked into that skeptic and then all you look for are the troubles and the problems and and you'll find them you know that's easy enough or you spend you know a lifetime building a bridge and then you realize oh but i, I wanted to go that way <laughs> I think that happens a lot, right? Or we spend a lifetime looking for the nails and the wood and saying, we're never going to find the nails or we're never going to find the wood. And meanwhile, like, you know, we're over there trying to build that bridge and, and we've lost the flow of, of ever changing life of, oh, well, then just go here now. Right. Um, No, I love it. I love it so much. Um, It is always such a pleasure and an honor to talk to you. Um, I'm going to make sure that we have links to all of your stuff. Uh, in the in the comments so people look for those check out both of Chris's books check out the episode this week check out the first episode that we did because that one was also pretty cool if you haven't listened to that one yet um, and I can't wait for the next book tell us really quickly what it's about and then we, I as promised we will wrap up because I don't want to take all of your time so the the no self no problem workbook really is, is exactly what it sounds like it's just right prom- Exercise. You're writing another one. Okay, sorry, I'm cutting you off. Oh no, no. Then the other one that um, uh, my publisher and I were just kind of just at the very beginnings of this, so we're just we don't really even have a title, uh, but tentative title maybe is something like the the power of abstraction, and it's all about how we get in lo- we get lost in these abstract worlds, which is to say that we just get lost in thinking, and so it is another one of these. Um, you know what is. <laughs> What is spirituality? What is uh, mindfulness? What's it all about? And, you know, falling in love, falling out of love with abstraction, because we are all kind of, you know, in love with abstract thinking and we value it. You know, that's why IQ, you throw out your IQ score to someone and it just becomes very impressive. But this book, and again, it's just, you know, scribblings on napkins right now, but it is all about the, um, uh, falling out of love with abstraction and falling back in love with reality, which is to say nature and, and, and that flow. Oh, I love it. Really oh, I'm helpful. so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited for that one. All right. Very, very last question. Sure. When they did the study that we talked about in the beginning, right? I'm going to remind people in case they don't, didn't hear the whole thing. Um, so someone's alone in a room with their thoughts and they have the opportunity to shock themselves and about 50% of the men get uncomfortable enough with their own thoughts that they decide, Hey, I'm just going to shock myself right now. Um, did they ask people about their process? Did they say what was going on? Why did you do that? That's a great question. You know, I'd have to, I, I read that about a year or so ago. I'd have to actually reread it. It's a great question though. But, brain. Yeah. But you know, um, you know, it, it would be interesting in two ways. One, if people were insightful enough to realize, look, my right, they might not be. But then the other is also interesting. Whether they may not know, they may say, "Look, I don't know. I was just right. bored, so I started shocking right. myself." Right, or they may make up reasons that help us to understand why people think they're doing what they're doing when what they're doing is irrational. Yeah, and right? you know, it fits into this bigger puzzle of why we do, you know people do drugs people they're trying to escape from something right and you know and so the the study really does point to like maybe the the thing we're really escaping isn't the problems the real problems in our life it's this the relentless thinking mind that just doesn't seem to have an off switch yeah yeah absolutely and we talked about a little bit in the episode a period in my life that i had not so long ago with a lot of anxiety and mental turmoil, which was an interesting experience for me. And it was that thing, everything in the outside world was just fine. Um, And it was really a remembering of, you know, you gotta, you gotta tend to what's going on between your, your eardrums. Right. Um, Actually, I don't know if that's where it is, but (laughs) you have to tend to the mind and the mental chatter and, and learn to cope with that. The outside world will take care of itself. So most of your thoughts. And one of the things I do in the 
workbook is to have people journal. You know, you can prove to yourself that most of your thoughts never turn out to be the way you think they will. And so, you know, for me, I just got through a huge event in my life with a, about an eight-year lawsuit, and, uh, and it, which resulted leaving in, leaving academia altogether. And all along the way, my thinking mind was like, this is wrong. This is, it, it just had one thought after another. And if I did a chart, I could show you like, look, every, every thought I had was, was inaccurate. My, my thinking mind, like you said, early on, you're like, I don't think the thinking mind is too good at solving problems. <laughs> and it, it's but again, really good at creating them. It's great at creating them. And then trying to convince you that it has the way, you know, this is the person who thinks that money will solve their problems or, you know, it thinks that it's going to it, it put some carrot out there saying, look, this is the, the, the thing that will solve it. But, you know, when you get to like, I'm 55 and, you know, it's just, I've had too much experience with the thinking mind being so far off track. I actually kind of laugh at it. I mean, I just, it just kind of seems like maybe God put it in as kind of a joke for us to discover. (laughs) 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 Uh Yeah. Like, look, you know, it folds you a thousand times. And then for some of us, like a thousand and one, we kind of start to get it and we're like, okay. And so I'm not going to fall for it, you know, 2000 times. And it unplugs the energy of it a little bit. And I, mean, I think it makes it, it is it's like simultaneous. You unplug the energy of the thinking mind and that flow just, it like fills in the space immediately. It does. Yeah. And it's a good feeling. And I think for me, um, I'm not a meditator. I'm not, you know, when I work, my mind often goes away because there's just no room for my mind when I'm doing the work that I do. But a lot of times too, it's the spontaneousness of bliss that arises within me. It just comes. It's this amazing feeling of all is well. Um, And it started happening to me probably about a decade ago. And now it happens more and more and more and more and more. And sometimes I can even like cultivate it now, which is a really nice thing. I believe that those are the moments when I'm free. Those are the moments when the mind is turned off. Those are the moments when I'm, you know, aligned. And that's that's the natural state of your soul. Yeah. That's, I think that's most species. That, that's their natural state. That's yeah. the state they're in most of the time. Yeah. We're just an anomaly. <laughs> yep. Agreed. All right, Chris, all your information is in the, will be in the whatever, <laughs> in the comments, in the show notes. Check out the show. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me and um, share with everybody. And um, yeah, it's always so much fun to connect with Thanks. you. Thanks, Victoria. You know, time always ceases to exist when we chat. I know, it really, <laughs> truly <laughs> does. I look down, I'm like, that couldn't have been like 50 minutes. <laughs> That's great. All right. So Thank you, pleasure. everybody, for tuning in. Um, and uh, I'll see you all. I'll see you all when I see you. I don't know when that'll be. But I think our next episode is actually on analysis paralysis. That's the one following yours. So mm-hmm. um, maybe we'll come back and chat about this topic a little more. All right, everyone have a great day and namaste.